Today we'll be zooming in close to the surface of the Earth, where the gravity is constant. When an object falls from some height at rest, its speed starts off at zero, but then increases. And so its height changes over time. But how, exactly? Let's plot it. Ready, set, go! And it's a nice vertical drop straight down the line, parabolic in time, very well done. If you knew nothing else about gravity, you could experimentally drop things and time them as they fall. You would arrive at this curve, assuming the thing is dense enough that air resistance is negligible. And if you know your algebra, you'll recognize this curve as a parabola. It ends up being the height of the object minus one-half of some acceleration factor times time squared. And that's all fine and good, that's fitting math to uh, experimental data, there's nothing wrong with that. But, there is a deep connection here to the ideas that we explored in the previous video, and it's worth seeing. So remember from the previous video that we had an equation for the acceleration of the Earth's gravitational field. Well today we're zoomed in near the surface of the Earth, and so our r value is basically just the radius of the Earth. If you go up a little bit above ground, or if you're on ground, it doesn't really make a difference as far as how far away you are from the center of the Earth, right? So well, let's plug in the gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, and the radius of the Earth, and we can calculate what the acceleration is going to be near the surface of the Earth. When we crunch the numbers shown here on the screen, we end up with 9.8 meters per second squared, also known as 32.2 .2 feet per second squared. If you've studied a bit of physics, surely you've seen this number before. In fact, it has a name. It's called little g. What little g is, is a rate of acceleration which is constant no matter where you go on Earth. Well, okay, it actually can vary by maybe half a percent if you're on a mountain or depending on your latitude, but it's pretty constant, 9.8 or 32.2. The important thing to know about little g is that even though it applies wherever you go on Earth, it's not actually a universal constant. Big G is the universal constant. That's the thing that's the same no matter where you measure it throughout the universe, as far as we can tell. Little g is big G mixed in with the peculiarities of the Earth, so it's big G times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared. And so it's a, you might say, planetary constant, but it's not actually a universal constant. It's derived from deeper universal principles. And so this derivation of little g that I'm showing you here it's not that we're adding an extra bit of information as we go, we're not adding characters to our story. No, rather, little g is implicit in all of the ideas that we already went over in the last video. It comes out of the theory, and it's not just something that we put into the theory. And that's really profound. That kind of parsimony is what separates physics from just a mindless accounting of empirical data. The fact that physics can be so tightly compressed into such a small set of axioms, and then unfolded to give rise to the landscape we see around us, is very profound. It's pretty cool that our theory of gravity lets us calculate little g from deeper principles, but those principles can actually also be used to calculate the entire parabolic curve in time. And to do that, let's say we point our z-axis up and so negative is down, in that case acceleration would be negative g, and then velocity is just the accumulation of acceleration over time, so we write that in the language of calculus as an integral, from time equals zero up to some time t, that gives you the velocity as a function of time. That velocity is just going to be negative gt, because that's just, uh, you know, linear start at zero, and then every second you get a g worth of, a g times a second worth of velocity. So if one second goes by, you get 9.8 meters per second of added velocity. Now we can apply very similar reasoning to calculate the height over time from the velocity equation. Again, we just let it accumulate over time. Now this time we notice that height starts at some h value, so z when time equals zero we'll call h, the drop height. And then we do the same kind of integral to let the velocity accumulate over time, 
And when we integrate negative gt dt, you know, when you take an integral of a polynomial, you add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, so the t gets promoted to a t squared, and then we divide by 2. And that's why we end up with the equation that z equals h minus 1 half gt squared. So you see, little g doesn't just come out of nowhere, it's not something we're just making up, it's a consequence of our equations. And likewise, this parabolic curve in time, this h minus 1 half gt squared, it's not just something we make up, it's not just some disconnected, arbitrary equation that we have to memorize. No, it comes directly out of our universal gravitational acceleration equation. What a beautiful concept. This law has been called the greatest generalization achieved by the human mind. And you can get already from the, by introduction, I'm more interested not so much in the human mind as in the marvel of nature who can obey such an elegant and simple law as this law of gravitation. So our main concentration will not be on how clever we are to have found it all out, but on how clever she is to pay attention to it. I don't want to be accused of misquoting Feynman, so I should say that in his lecture he introduced Newtonian gravity starting with the equation for force between two objects. So that is that the gravitational force between any two objects is g times the product of their masses divided by r squared. And it is true, so the force equation actually is slightly more general than the acceleration equation we've been looking at, in that between any two objects there is a gravitational force. It's just that that force is so weak that if you're near Earth, typically you're just interested in the gravity from the Earth acting on objects in its vicinity. And in that case, you can write the force equation as g times big M times little m over r squared, where big M is the mass of the Earth, little m is the mass of the object, and r is the distance between their two centers of masses. Then if you recognize that the force on an object is the object's mass times its acceleration, you realize you can divide little m out of that formula, and what you end up with is that acceleration equation around the Earth. And so, if you're talking about Newtonian gravity in the context of objects near Earth, you may as well use the simpler equation A equals gm over r squared. But yeah, I mean, it's worth noting that a more general way of stating Newtonian gravity is that the force between any two objects is actually g mass 1 times mass 2 over r squared. And we'll see in our video on the two-body problem and the three-body problem how the force equation actually is really useful. Then, when we get to the infinite body problem, we'll see how we can actually create an even more general statement of Newtonian gravity, in the simple statement that the Laplacian of the potential field is proportional to the mass density field, we'll see that all of Newtonian gravity can be summed up in that single statement. And that will be a wonderful jumping off point to go from Newtonian gravity to general relativity. Because the Laplacian of a field is not exactly the curvature of the field, but it's not exactly not the curvature of the field, you know, it's a kind of a curvy thing. And the mass density field is not exactly the mass energy density, but it's not exactly not that either, okay? So when we look at Newtonian gravity from the perspective of this Poisson equation, we'll see that uh, actually Newtonian gravity isn't just an empirical approximation of relativity, but there's actually some philosophical foreshadowing there too. But anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. That's going to be a future video. For now, let's return to the topic of projectile motion near the surface of the Earth. Alright, well here I have captured a ball in a box. Now this ball is perfectly elastic, so as it bounces around in the box, it doesn't lose any energy, it just keeps on bouncing. And the box is just there to keep the ball on the screen so that we can look at it. The ball is undergoing gravitational acceleration, its inertia carries it forward, gravity bends its path downward, and so it hops around with this series of parabolic arcs. If we want to understand the essence of projectile motion in constant gravity, all we have to do is understand this ball's motion through this box. In order to precisely understand the motion of the ball, we'll first need to develop a vocabulary. You know, concepts are downstream from words. Uh, where if one cannot speak, there if one must remain silent, and so the first thing we have to do if we want to understand this ball's motion is to precisely define what we mean by motion. And there is perhaps no simpler way to define where a ball is than by listing its coordinates x, y, and z at any moment in time. This set of numbers, x, y, and z, can also be thought of as a vector. So here in the animation you can see these blue dashed lines, and those represent the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate, and the z-coordinate of the ball at every moment in time. 
but you can also see this solid diagonal line, which you can think of as an arrow or a vector or the composite set of all those three x, y, and z numbers. And that position vector will call x with an arrow on top of it. Now the important thing to remember is that when you see x with an arrow, that's a code. It means x, y, z. It means that set of three position points. It doesn't just mean x, it means the vector, the position vector. So you see x is a general stand-in for x, y, and z. So that's our first matter of definition. The position vector is a set of three numbers, x, y, and z, which are the coordinates of the ball at any moment in time. All right, well now that we have a precise definition of the ball's position, we can say exactly what it means to solve for the ball's motion over time. All we have to do is find or derive an equation where you plug in some value for time and it gives you the position vector of the ball at that instant in time. If we can do that, then we know everything there is to know about the motion of the ball. We know where it's going to be and when it's going to be there. And by operating mathematically on that equation, we can learn other things too. Like for example, what is the speed of the ball at any moment? That's just the derivative of the position vector in time, or in other words, the rate of change of the position vector. And that velocity vector, shown here in green, is the vector that points along the instantaneous direction of the path, and its length is the speed of the ball at that moment in time. We can get that directly out of the position vector. We don't need any other information. If we know the, how the position vector changes over time, then simply by mathematically doing a time derivative, we can calculate the velocity. Likewise, by taking the second derivative in time of the position vector, we can derive the acceleration. By the way, when I was making this animation, I was very proud of it. I'm like, wow, these walls, look, they appear, and then it makes a sound, procedurally generated audio, like this is next level. I'm really happy with how this ball in the box animation turned out, except the one thing, the velocity vector, it's hard to tell if it's pointing into the screen or out of the screen. There's kind of this optical illusion where it kind of looks like it's always pointing out or always pointing in, depending on how you look at it. So anyway, forgive that detail. But aside from that, and you can sort of imagine it, it, it just imagine the velocity vector is pointing along the direction of the path at any moment, and you can see how it works. So the other cool thing to notice about the velocity vector is that the velocity actually remains constant in x and y. Now, except when it bounces off the wall, then one of the components of velocity gets switched around the other way. But if you look at it between bounces, when it's doing a parabolic trajectory, the important thing to notice is that the x and y components of velocity remain constant, while the z component of velocity bends. It gets accelerated over time. It gets pulled downward. And we already know the acceleration. The acceleration vector in this coordinate system would be 0, 0, negative g, meaning no acceleration in x, no acceleration in y, and negative g acceleration in z. And so that gives us the clue for how we can solve for the position vector. All we have to do is integrate over time twice. Remember, just like before, we just accumulate acceleration into velocity, accumulate velocity into position, except this time we're using a full three-dimensional vector equation rather than just a single z value like we did before. But conceptually, philosophically, in essence, it's exactly the same. When we integrate the acceleration twice over time, we end up with the equation that the position vector equals some initial position vector when we start the clock at t equals zero, plus some initial velocity vector at t equals zero, times time, plus one half of our constant acceleration vector times time squared. Now if you think about it, the equation we calculated earlier where z equals h minus one half at squared, you can see how that's actually a specific case of this more general vector equation. In that case, we set x equals 0, y equals 0, and we just look at how the z component of the position vector evolves over time, and our initial vector x0 would be 0, 0, h, and of course, uh, given that our acceleration is 0, 0, negative g, you end up with z equals h minus 1 half gt squared. Now in this case, in the vector equation, it's much more general. It applies for any initial position and any initial velocity, and then you just let time go on, and as the t number increases, this equation gives you the position vector over time. By the way, in this ball in the box animation, I've actually been cheating. I haven't been using this vector equation to evolve the ball's position over time. Instead, I've actually been doing what's called a numerical solution, where at each frame, I just update the velocity and the position, so it's linear steps at every frame. And so I didn't actually have to solve the equation to implement the animation that you see here. But as I was editing the video, I had kind of a guilty conscience about that, and so I thought, you know what, during this animation, at each collision event, I really should render the full analytic parabola 
just so that you can see that this math actually has a predictive power. And so now what I'm showing on the screen here is the forward projected parabola before the numerical simulation actually gets there. So in other words, you can see that this math actually is predictive and you can use it to really understand and map out these parabolic trajectories. If you'll notice, if you look very closely, there's actually a little bit of difference between the two paths, between the predicted path and the actual path. And that just has to do with the fact that the numerical approach, the one where we just step forward in time at every frame, has a bit of error that's called discretization error. The word discretization comes from the fact that in discrete math you have these chunky steps, you have these time steps, whereas the analytic solution is continuous in time. And so you get the propagation of these small amounts of error due to the frame rate not being perfectly smooth. Anyway, that's kind of a tangent. Earlier, I mentioned that we can get the velocity by taking a time derivative of the position equation. And sure enough, if you take the time derivative of this position vector equation, the x0 factor, which does not have any factor of t, that drops out of the equation. The v0 times t factor just becomes constant v0, so the initial velocity. And then the 1 half at squared factor becomes at. And so the derivative of the position over time, in other words the velocity, is just some initial velocity plus the acceleration times time, which makes sense. That's what we would expect. Likewise, when we take the second derivative in time, so we take another derivative of the v0 plus at equation, now the v0 factor drops out because it has no time dependence, and the at factor just becomes a. And so, taking the second derivative, we recognize that the acceleration from our position equation is just the constant acceleration vector, which is what we would expect. Okay, now let's think outside of the box. So let's say we have a cannon, and we're firing cannonballs with some velocity and some angle. And the question we want to answer is what is the range of the cannonball, so how far does it go, and also how long is it in the air? We can answer both of these questions using our formula that the position vector is some initial position vector plus v0 t plus 1 half acceleration vector times time squared. So the first thing we'll do is get that x0 vector. To make our lives easier, we might as well set the origin of the coordinate system at the cannon so that our initial position of the cannonball is 0, 0, 0. And that lets us drop the x0 term out of the equation. Now we need our initial velocity. And so in our coordinate system, we'll say x, y, z, so x is going to point along the direction of motion horizontally, y is going to point into the screen so the, the cannonball is not moving in y, and uh, z points up. So our velocity vector, that initial velocity, is going to be some initial x component of velocity, so some amount of horizontal motion, comma zero, so the y component is going to be zero, it's not moving into or out of the screen, and then the z component is also going to be some z component of velocity. Now what we know is the speed and the angle of the ball, so to get the x and z components we just draw a triangle and do a bit of trigonometry, and we see that the x component of the velocity is going to be v times the cosine of theta, and the z component of the velocity is going to be v times the sine of theta. So that gives us our initial velocity vector, v cosine theta, comma zero, comma v sine theta. And of course we know our acceleration vector is zero, zero, negative g. So now we can write our equation of motion, the cannonball's position over time is going to be v cosine theta comma zero comma v sine theta all times t plus one half of zero zero negative g that vector times t squared. Now we can take this vector equation and package it into a single vector. So the x terms go with the x terms, the y terms go with the y terms, and the z terms go with the z terms. When we package it into a single vector, we get that the position vector as a function of time is vt cosine theta in x, 0 in y, and vt sine theta minus 1 half gt squared in z. Now we want to solve for the range and the flight time of the cannonball. So to do that, we'll say that the flight time is given by capital T, and at time capital T, the position vector will be some range r in x, it'll still be 0 in y, and it'll be at a height of 0 in z. So in other words, after the cannonball has flown for some flight time capital T, it'll be on the ground at some range distance away. Now all we have to do is solve this equation for r and t in terms of v and theta, and that's the solution to the range problem. Okay, so now let's solve the equation. With a vector equation, you can always imagine it as a set of scalar equations that are all simultaneously true. So we have a vector in three dimensions, and that gives us three equations. 
However, the second equation is 0 equals 0, so the y component really doesn't tell us anything, but that's okay. Let's look at the x component and the z component. So for the x equation, we have that v capital T cosine theta equals capital R. And for the z component, we have that vt sine theta minus 1 half gt squared equals 0. Now for that z component, let's go ahead and factor out a t. And so then it makes it easier to solve because that equation has two solutions in time. One at time equals 0. So in other words, z equals 0 at time equals 0. But we already know that because as we're launching the cannonball, we start the clock. And, uh, you know, its height is zero right at the instant that it starts. So we can neglect that solution. It tells us something that we already know. The second solution for t occurs when the term inside the parentheses equals zero. And if we rearrange that term in the parentheses, we end up solving for capital T equals 2v over g times sine of theta. So that's the equation for the flight time. Twice the velocity divided by g, little g, times sine of theta. Now we also notice that because of the x component of the equation, we have the range in terms of the flight time and the velocity and the cosine of the angle. So by substituting in the equation for t into that equation for r, we can also solve for r. When we do that, we get that the range is 2 times velocity squared divided by little g times sine of theta times cosine of theta. Here we can use a trigonometric identity to simplify the equation a little bit. So you might be familiar with the identity that 2 times sine of theta times cosine of theta is actually equal to the sine of 2 theta. So let's go ahead and use that and simplify the equation a little bit. And now let's write the range equation as velocity squared divided by little g times sine of 2 theta. So this is the solution to the range problem. Now let's explore what these solutions actually look like. So here I'm plotting the range as a function of the variables v and theta. So as a function of the takeoff velocity and angle, the color map shows the range of the projectile, of the cannonball. And here you can see that the angle that maximizes the range is 45 degrees, which makes sense, but now we can mathematically show that that's the case. You can see also that the range goes up with the square of velocity. So if you double the takeoff velocity, you quadruple the range. If you triple the takeoff velocity, you multiply the range by a factor of 9. And one way you can think about that is, well, the faster the ball is going, the longer it's in the air, and also the faster it's going to the side per unit time, and so velocity factors in twice, so it's velocity squared. But of course, now we also have a solid mathematical argument for why the equation is exactly what it is. All right, let's look at the flight time equation. So here, we see the equation 2v over little g times sine theta, and we see that if you want to maximize the time that the cannonball is up in the air, you want to fire it straight up. Any velocity to the side is just a waste of velocity. And the flight time goes linearly with the velocity. So if you double the speed, you double the flight time. Triple the speed, triple the flight time. Here I'm showing an animation of a bunch of cannonballs fired at exactly the same speed, but a whole range of angles. And you can see that the one which goes the farthest, that gray cannonball, is launched at 45 degrees. But notice, the one that stays in the air the longest, the red cannonball, is the one that goes at 90 degrees. And so this animation helps us confirm the fact that these range and flight time equations actually make sense. Alright, so that was an example of using our position vector equation for projectile motion to solve the range problem. And in general, any projectile motion problem really comes back to that same equation. Position vector is x0 plus v0 t plus 1 half acceleration vector time squared. That's like the solution key to any projectile motion problem. And when you're dealing with a specific problem, the only thing that'll vary is what information you know. So for example, you might know the velocity at one moment in time and the position at another moment in time. And all you have to do is work that equation in a way that you put in what you know and then it tells you the whole motion of the thing. And then you, you can do a bit of calculus if you want need to calculate velocity or whatever. And so if you get familiar with that equation, learn to work that vector equation. It totally generalizes over the set of all possible projectile motion problems. In constant gravity, that is. Uh, the equation gets a little more complicated when we're zooming out and looking at satellites and things, and we'll learn how to deal with that in a future video. Anyway, for this video, I showed you the general solution to projectile motion in constant gravity, showed you an example where we can apply it to solve the range problem, and if you're interested and you want to follow up on this and, and work your skills, here's a challenge for you. Solve the range problem where the cannon starts off at some height h above the ground where it lands. So imagine it's being launched off of a cliff or off of the walls of a castle or something. So to solve that problem, I'd recommend you start with your position vector at 0, 0, h, and then follow the same procedure. You'll end up having to use the quadratic equation, and the solution will be a little messier, and that h parameter will factor in so it's a solution of more variables, 
But if you can solve that problem, then I think you've really got the gist of projectile motion and constant gravity. One thing some of you might have noticed is that in this video we've been looking at the acceleration, but what about potential? I mean, in the last video we were talking about potential and acceleration, and these things were like two sides of the same coin, two peas in a pod. But this video we haven't talked about potential at all. The reason for that is that if you want to get a feel for projectile motion, the first way to understand it is in terms of acceleration. But we'll see that potential actually has a role to play here, and that the notion of potential energy and kinetic energy and exchanging between these two can actually make a lot of problems much simpler, even in the context of constant gravity. So in the next video, we're going to be exploring that a little bit, but our emphasis won't be so much on projectile motion as introducing the potential in constant gravity, showing you the idea of gauge invariance, and waxing a bit philosophical or poetic about the nature of the potential, whether it's real, whether it's an accounting tool, whether it's just an idea, or whether it reflects some deeper reality. So that'll be kind of a fun video. I know these first two videos have been pretty mathy, and we'll get into the math on the next video too, but this series is really about the nature of gravity, so I'm not going to shy away from these existential questions too, and so I'm looking forward to the next video, and I think we're going to have some fun in exploring those ideas, and maybe going off and, you know, being a bit speculative, but in a way that is also well-grounded in the equations. So really looking forward to that one, and I hope to see you there.